It's 9-11 today. And you know what? Everybody forgot about September 11th, 2001 out there in America. How do I know? I watched the presidential debate last night. I'll have all the information on how I arrived at this miserable conclusion coming up on In Focus. All right, so first the headlines. Uh, this morning, um, we had two gorgeous reservists in the IDF who were killed in a helicopter crash along the Philadelphia corridor when they and their team came to rescue, to evacuate a wounded combat engineer uh, from the area. Two soldiers were killed and six were wounded, three critically, in this helicopter crash, which is now being investigated by the Air Force. Another soldier was critically wounded this morning while he was manda- manning a uh, an outpost or really a uh, a watch post um, in the Benjamin region at uh, Asaf Hill. And here I just want to show you the uh, footage of what happened. That's what they're talking about when they're talking about a car ramming attack. You had a fuel truck that came and just mowed down this soldier, and the uh, driver was killed by uh, the soldier's uh, colleagues uh, shortly thereafter. But the f- the soldier, the poor soldier who was just guarding, um, is now fighting for his life, and that is what terrorism looks like. It's ugly. And on September 11, 2001, what happened? You had 19 Islamic terrorists who, with able assistance from Iran, as the 9-11 Commission showed, uh, hijacked four airliners, and committed an act of mass murder, the likes of which humanity hadn't seen, really, uh, where they killed nearly 3,000 Americans, took down the two towers, the Twin Towers, crashed into the Pentagon, and they were on their way somewhere else when uh, the passengers, uh, the incredible heroic passengers of Flight 93, uh, crashed uh, their plane into a field in Pennsylvania. So that was on 9-11. The United States was attacked by radical Islam. And what happened shortly thereafter? Then President Bush ignored the fact that they were attacked, that his country was attacked by a specific kind of Muslim operating under a specific doctrine of jihad. And instead, he started talking about the need to bring democracy to the Arab world. And he invaded uh, Afghanistan, rightly, and he invaded Iraq, arguably rightly, but rather than go after the bad guys, he decided that there had to be good guys there somewhere, and he set out on an adventure or a misadventure of trying to transform Iraq and Afghanistan into revolutionary Virginia and Massachusetts, and it didn't work. At any rate, 23 years later, what's left of that? Well, I think what's left of that is the vacuous uh, discussion that we had at the presidential debate last night in relation to Israel. And what I want to do is go through what happened, first of all, in relation to Israel, and then at the end I'll draw, you know, more general, uh, more general lessons uh, given uh, the anniversary of 9-11 and really what this uh, pathological discourse really means for charting a course for American foreign policy in the Middle East and more generally going forward. So here, without, uh, without further ado, I want to go to the videotape, and let's just remember. So uh, there were two moderators, David Muir and Lindsey Davis. And Lindsey Davis was responsible for moderating the part of the debate last night about uh, the war in Israel, uh, the war between uh, Hamas, an Islamic terrorist organization, very similar, in fact, identical in doctrine to al-Qaeda and to ISIS, um, that uh, is waging war of annihilation against the state of Israel today. And the main battlefield in that war is Gaza. But as we saw this morning in that heinous uh, ramming attack uh, in the Benjamin region uh, of Judea and Samaria, it's carried out of multiple battlegrounds. And also, obviously, their allies, they're all Iranian, of course, uh, proxies in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Syria, and in Jordan, where we had somebody coming through and executing three Israeli guards at the Allenby Bridge crossing last week. But let's go to the videotape. 
and see what happened at the debate last night in relation to Israel. We're going to go through it. You know, we're going to go through it play by play. That's what we're going to do today. Okay, where I'm going to give you a play by play of that. So let's start with Davis. She was the one who moderated, and she poses a question, an interesting question, interesting in scare quotes, to Vice President Kamala Harris. Let's let's listen to what she says. Now yes. to the Israel-Hamas war and the hostages who are still being held, Americans among them. Vice President Harris, in December you said, quote, Israel has a right to defend itself, but you added, quote, it matters how, saying international humanitarian law must be respected, Israel must do more to protect innocent civilians. You said that nine months ago. Now an estimated 40,000 Palestinians are dead. Nearly 100 hostages remain. Just last week, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said there's not a deal in the making. President Biden has not been able to break through the stalemate. How would you do it? So Davis begins and she says, uh, Israel, Hamas war wages on. There are hostages being held in Gaza. OK, who is holding them? There are still hostages, she said. Where are they being held? She doesn't say. They're in Gaza. Who's holding them? Hamas. Who took them hostage? Hamas did. Never mentions any of that, right? And then what else does she say? She says, nine months ago, and here's, here's what, this is the beginning of the fun part. That was fun in a way, but here's nine months ago, you, Vice President Harris, said Israel has a right to defend itself, but it matters how it's done it. And look, lo and behold, 40,000 Palestinians have been killed. In other words, what she's saying, Israel didn't take your advice. They've killed 40,000 Palestinians. Of course, that's not a real number. That's Hamas's number, and it's made up, and it's not true, and, and all the rest of it. And by the way, how Israel fights? Well, we have the lowest civilian to, uh, to combatant or terrorist, in this case, casualty uh, rates in human history, right? And in recent months, it's been less than one dead civilian to each dead terrorist. In other words, almost no civilians have been killed. And even from the outset, we had the lowest civilian to terrorist casualty rate in the history of modern warfare. Okay, that's, that's just a true statement. But she's saying 40,000 based on Hamas's data. So that's just a little data point. But then she says, um, she says they've been killed. Now, who killed the, is, who killed the Palestinians? Well, we know Israel killed the Palestinians, and they're named as Palestinians. Does she say who the hostages are? She said some of whom are Americans. Well, who are the others, right? Who are the other ones who aren't American? She never says. Who is holding the hostages whose, you know, whose identity is unidentified, right, is hidden? Well, she doesn't say. Again, who took them? She doesn't say. Where are they being held? She doesn't say. Who are they? Well, some of them are Americans. In other words, Israel is gone. Israel is not a victim. This Lindsay Davis, let me tell you, she's sort of like a chip off the old block of Angela Davis, right? Anyway, Lindsay Davis, she doesn't mention anything about the Israelis who were savagely attacked, savagely kidnapped into Gaza and are being held in inhumane conditions and being executed, as we saw, by Hamas. She says hostages are being held and Israel killed Based on Hamas numbers, but she doesn't say that, 40,000 Palestinians, they are the victims. Okay, and Kamala Harris told us not to do that nine months ago. Then, that's not enough, she has to go on to Netanyahu. So what does she say about Netanyahu? There's not a deal in the making. Okay, with whom? Well, we don't know, because she never mentions Hamas, right? She doesn't say anything about Hamas. It's not that there's a deal that has to be made with Hamas or that Hamas are bad, only that Israel killed 40,000 Palestinians, and Netanyahu is saying there is no deal in the making. So there's no other side. It's all Israel's decision. Israel's the only one who's killed anybody, right? Hostages are being held by people who are not named, and Israel is the one that's blocking a ceasefire deal that would bring the hostages home. This lady is, is a piece of work. This is not journalism. This is pure propaganda, and she's not done yet, right? Because then she says, Biden has failed to make a breakthrough. What would you do, given that, right, the evil Israeli murderers who killed 40,000 Palestinians um, aren't willing to give a deal for a ceasefire? Obviously, the concept of Israel winning, I mean, <laughs> what? Right? I mean, come on. So Kamala starts, hopefully. Let's just listen to the beginning of the vice president's response. Let's understand how we got here. On October 7th. 
Hamas, a terrorist organization, slaughtered 1,200 Israelis, many of them young people who were simply attending a concert. Women were horribly raped. And so absolutely, I said then, I say now, Israel has a right to defend itself. We would. And how it does so matters. So she says, Israel has a right to defend it. First, she goes through, she says, Israel was attacked. Well, see, I'm pro-Israel. I'm mentioning that 1,200 Israelis were murdered in cold blood and that many, many women were raped in the most brutal fashion. Fantastic. And then she says that Israel has a right to defend itself just like we would. So this is great. This is what an ally would say, right? Right. Except now the gaslighting begins. So let's just go on to what she says next. What's her next statement? And how it does so matters. Because it is also true, far too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. Children, mothers. So here is where she and Davis meet. So Kamala Harris says how Israel defends itself matters. Yes, but we know how Israel defends itself in the most humane manner in human history, right? And, you know, maybe we shouldn't mention the fact that the Palestinian women and children and men and boys and all the rest of them participated in the Hamas invasion, participated in the hostage-taking, in the raping, in the burning of alive of, of the victims. I mean, in Be'eri, for instance, right, the, 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 the perpetrators, I guess you'd say, of the actual burning of the homes that we had so many families who were simply incinerated all together in their safe rooms, right, that incineration, the honor in doing that and holding the torch that lit these little houses on fire was given to children. They were conducted, they were burned alive by 12-year-old Gazans to the great applause of all of the adults around them. This is, this is what happened, right, on October 7th. But anyway, so, and then they were all, they all got the hero's welcome when they got to Gaza and we saw school teachers and doctors and all the normal upstanding civilians, they were the ones holding the hostages in their homes and starving them to death, right? But be that as it may, she, what she says, she says, mothers and children have been killed. By whom? By Israel, right? So she says, children, mothers. Again, not true, right? This is not how Israel fights. How Israel fights is supposedly, presumably, how she would want Israel to fight, all right, so what I'm giving you right now, the backstory, the context, is just reality. It's just facts. And this was a fact-free discourse, the entire thing, right, between Davis and Kamala Harris. She bows to reality when she mentions what happened on October 7th in passing in order to get to the point, right? And that point is that too many Palestinians have been killed. Not making, you know, no, no sense of what too many is or what would be enough, you know, what would be okay, right? It's just too many, right? And then, again, citing, based, basing this discourse on total lies, which are Hamas's statistics, which are part of their psychological warfare campaign to try to demonize Israel. And it's, obviously it's worked on ABC News, right? So that's what she says. Okay, and then she says... She does say that Hamas is a terrorist organization, right? She gave that. But the way that then she went on to discuss Israel draws an absolute moral equivalence between Hamas, which is a terrorist organization, and Israel that is wantonly killing women and children, right? Women and children, they're the ones who are being killed, right? That, that's what's happening. That's what she's talking about, and she's really upset about it. And then, okay, and then she says, uh, she comes to the point, or there are two points that she makes. There are two. Let's just go to the first one. Where do we have to go from here, from too many Palestinians being killed, women and children? Let's go. This war must end. It must when end immediately, and the way it will end is we need a ceasefire deal and we need the hostages out. And so we will continue to work around the clock on that. Ah. So the first thing that we have to do, the first point, is we have to get to a ceasefire immediately. We need a ceasefire now. But wait a minute. Let's just stop for a second. Ceasefire now means Hamas wins because they survived. So if you have a ceasefire now, what you're saying is Israel has to capitulate to Hamas's demands. Why did Benjamin Netanyahu say there is no deal to be had? Because Hamas won't make a deal. Well, under what circumstances will Hamas make a deal? 
if Israel capitulates to all of Hamas's demands. And what are Hamas's demands? Hamas's demands are for a complete Israeli capitulation to Hamas. And that includes emptying our prisons of, of all the terrorists like ever, right? Because we have to pay uh, 50 to one for, uh, to get our female soldiers home. And we have to pay, I think it's a hundred to one ratio to get our male soldiers home, right? Dead or alive, doesn't matter. You have to release 100 live, house, 100 live terrorists, mass murders from Israel's prisons, including the ones who conducted the atrocities on October 7th, in order to get the hostages out. That's the deal, and Hamas remains in charge. It has control over the international border with Egypt, so it'll be able to rebuild its forces very quickly and fight another day and, re and, and emerge victorious after it invaded Israel and committed the atrocities on October 7th and took the hostages uh, to Gaza, where it has been summarily executing them and then posting their photos, right? And and their pleas for Israel because it's all, as I talked about in my interview this week with uh, Dr. Ron Schleifer about psychological warfare, it's all part of the same effort to force Israel to capitulate. And here is the Vice President of the United States saying Israel has to capitulate. We need a ceasefire now, given that Hamas won't agree to any of the terms that the United States has put, 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 has put forward, which, by the way, are horrible for Israel, but all the same, and and once an unconditional surrender by Israel and total capitulation in the form of releasing wholesale all of the terrorists that are in our prisons, including the ones who carried out the October 7th atrocities, right, that she's saying that's what has to be done, because that's what it means to say that you need a ceasefire now. It means that Hamas wins. That's what it means. It doesn't mean anything else. It means Hamas wins, okay? And so that's what she's saying, but it's not. she's not done yet because then she has a second point. Let's watch what the second point is. And so we will continue to work around the clock on that. Work around the clock also understanding that we must chart a course for a two-state solution. And in that solution, there must be security for the Israeli people and Israel and an equal measure for the Palestinians. Two-state solution, we need a two-state solution. Israel will always have the right to defend itself. Really? Well, mainly when it fights Iran. What does it mean to defend itself? Well, we know that already as well. It's not that she will agree to have Israel attack Iran's nuclear installations. It's not that she'll agree to, to you know, support Israel when we take out their ballistic missiles and cruise missiles and drones facilities. No. So it's not that Israel removes Iran's ability to either nuke Israel or to attack us massively with missiles and drones. No, 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 no. We're allowed to do what we did on the night of April 13th, 14th, which is that we're allowed to catch the incoming missiles on route, right? And, and that's how we defend ourselves. We defend ourselves not by going on offense, not by destroying their ability to attack us, but rather they'll, they'll give us Iron Dome missiles, right? They'll, they'll give us, uh, they'll give us uh, uh, aero missile systems. And they'll pay for them. They'll, I don't know what. But we'll have those so that we can catch most of the missiles coming in. We're not allowed to actually remove the threat because too many people have been killed, too many Palestinians, you know, women and children. And, you know, gosh, it's really bad. You can't win. You have to allow the problem to fester and grow. That's what we want. We want you to, you can catch missiles, right, but you're not allowed to actually obliterate the missiles on the ground to prevent them from being used against you. No, you're not allowed to do that. Same thing again with Gaza. You have to reach a ceasefire which leaves Hamas not only surviving, but victorious, because that's what a ceasefire now means, right? So that's what you have to do. We can, Israel can defend itself. And now let's get to the two-state solution. Right? So she wants, so we can't, we, and by the way, when she says especially Iran, what she's really saying is not the Palestinians. Israel cannot defend itself against the Palestinians. Only Iran and Iran, it's purely defensive. But what will happen to the Palestinians? Ah, they get a state. They get a state in Gaza, which we're going to rebuild, courtesy of American taxpayers. Looking forward to that, guys. You get to rebuild Gaza for Hamas, which will remain in charge because we got a ceasefire now through Israeli capitulation to Hamas, right? To Al-Qaeda, to Al-Qaeda's Palestinian branch, right? Al-Qaeda was an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, and Hamas is a Muslim Brotherhood branch in the land of Israel, a.k.a. Palestine, right? So that's, they're the same. So what she's saying is let al-Qaeda win. Win, defeat Israel, let Iran, which was, you know, an in, 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 
integral um, actor engaged, involved in training through Hezbollah and others itself, the, the, the hijackers on 9-11, right, give them a win. Israel is allowed to intercept their missiles, right, but it's not allowed to attack Iran because that's not defense. That's offense. Israel's not allowed to go on offense. That's very clear. There's no offense here. There's no winning here, right? It's only, only defense. So, and we give them a state. Americans are going to pay to rebuild Gaza, right, or Israel if we can force Israel to do that, right, and they're going to have equal measures of security, she says, what does that mean? I'm sorry, why don't the Palestinians have security? Who endangered their security on October 6th? Not Israel. No, it's Hamas, but Hamas is supposed to win in order to get to a ceasefire now. And plus, Palestinians, they're the good guys, right? Only Israel is killing civilians. Only Israel is killing mothers and children now. Right? There's, there's no Hamas anymore. This is all about Israel and moral equivalence and Israel being worse than Hamas or at best on par with Hamas. So that's, that's where we're getting to now, right? Palestinians get security. Again, Palestinians get dignity and sovereignty. What, what about our hostages? What about the families that demand justice for their sufferings, for the destruction of their lives, for the destruction of their families, for the taking of their children, for the massacre of their children, for the rape of their daughters, for the decapitation of their sons, for the mutilation of their corpses? What about that? Nothing. 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 And, and one of the ironic or not really ironic, distressing aspects to this, right, is that Davis and Muir asked Trump, demanded that Trump explain himself, do you, do you support a Ukrainian victory? I'm not going to get into the war in Ukraine, okay? But Ukraine is supposed to win, and Trump is bad for apparently, you know, not being willing to back a Ukrainian victory because, of course, he doesn't want to go to war with Russia. But, you know, I'm not... Whether he's right or wrong, the point is that the moderators were attacking him because they were alleging that he doesn't want Ukraine to win. But nobody ever raised the possibility of Israel winning. To the contrary, the goal is twofold, as Kamala Harris said. It's a ceasefire that leaves Hamas not only surviving but victorious and a Palestinian state. That's what's supposed to happen, okay? That's the outcome that she wants. Would you know that from watching the show, from watching that, that debate? No, because it sounds so reasonable. Israel has a right to defend itself, right? Except that Israel is bad. And as Davis pointed out or made clear or obfuscated, told, her purpose was to obfuscate reality, is to not mention the fact that Israel was invaded by Hamas terrorists, that they are Islamic terrorists. By the way, there's no mention of Islam here, right? None. There's no mention of the doctrine of jihad, of the jihadist war of a total annihilation and subjugation that they're waging against the Jewish people. Nothing. Nothing. You wouldn't know that from anywhere. Okay. Now we go back to Lindsay Davis, the propagandist who pretends to be a journalist. So she turns to Donald Trump. The bad guy, right? And she uh, she brought, she she raises the same question to him. What does she say to him? President Trump, how would you negotiate with Netanyahu and also Hamas in order to get the hostages out and prevent the killing of more innocent civilians in Gaza? Well, obviously not. You know, what's your view of this war? How do you look at what's going on? What would you do? What would be your approach to handling this war? No, 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 no. How do you get to a ceasefire? How do you get hostages free? There's no no, there, there's no leeway here. She's dictating the desired outcome, and he has to explain how he's going to get everybody there. But the outcome, as I pointed out, is a disaster for Israel and, by the way, for humanity, because 23 years after 9-11, what you're seeing is that the United States today is siding with al-Qaeda. That's what you see in this policy towards Hamas. We want Hamas to win. We want to reward them with a state. Okay, that's where we are today in American foreign policy discourse on the Middle East, on Israel, etc. And how are we going to get there, right? Because too many Palestinians have been killed, you know, quoting the vice president, Kamala Harris. That, that's, what we're, that's where we are. 23 years after 9-11, what is the difference between, between Hamas and al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda mainly killed non-Jews, and Hamas mainly kills Jews, okay? Americans, non-Americans, Israelis, whatever. That's the difference between the two. Hamas's war is, is dedicated to wiping out the Jews in the Jewish state, and Al-Qaeda 
is going to leave them to do that, and they're going to wipe out America. Okay, that that's the idea. But they're, you know, they're the same thing. They're the same ideology. They have the same goal of an Islamic caliphate that rules the world. The world, and of course, it's not just Hamas, as we discussed last week. It's also the Palestinian Authority. It's also Islamic Jihad. They're all either controlled by Iran or aligned with Iran because they all share the same goal as the Ayatollahs, which is the annihilation of Western civilization. First and foremost, and the, and the number one on the list is the small state, the Jews that everybody get to hate because they're Jewish. Okay, that's, that's how Israel has been chosen as a primary, as the first target in this war. But again, 23 years ago today, we saw they did it to America. All right, that's, that's it. Now we get to, to Trump. So what's Trump's response to this? Well, he rambles a little bit, but I'm going to talk a little bit about his rambling. Let's just watch it. If I were president, it would have never started. If I were president, Russia would have never, ever — I know Putin very well — he would have never — and there was no threat of it either, by the way, for four years — have gone into Ukraine and killed millions of people when you add it up. Far worse than people understand what's going on over there. But when she mentions about Israel, all of a sudden, she hates Israel. She wouldn't even meet with Netanyahu when he went to Congress to make a very important speech. She refused to be there because she was at a sorority party of hers. She wanted to go to the sorority party. She hates Israel. If she's president, I believe that Israel will not exist within two years from now. And I've been pretty good at predictions, and I hope I'm wrong about that one. She hates Israel. At the same time, in her own way, she hates the Arab population because the whole place is going to get blown up. Arabs, Jewish people, Israel. Israel will be gone. It would have never happened. Iran was broke under Donald Trump. Now Iran has $300 billion because they took off all the sanctions that I had. Iran had no money for Hamas or Hezbollah or any of the 28 different uh, spheres of terror. And they are spheres of terror, horrible terror. They had no money. It was a big story, and you know it. You covered it very well, actually. They had no money for terror. They were broke. Now they're a rich nation. And now what they're doing is they're spreading that money around. Look at what's happening with the Houthis and Yemen. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. This would have never happened. I will get that settled and fast, and I'll get the war with Ukraine and Russia ended. If I'm president-elect, I'll get it done before even becoming president. Right, off he goes, Ukraine, but then he comes back and he says, Israel, Kamala Harris hates Israel. You know, I don't know, I don't want to put any emotion on it. Maybe she hates Israel, maybe she's calculating, maybe she's just doing what she thinks is going to get her elected. Whatever it is, her policy means that Israel loses this war for its survival. So, you know, in effect, if not in, in, in des by design, you know, her policy is deeply hateful towards Israel. That's true. Does she hate Israel? No. I don't know what she does. You know, one day she'll show up as a presidential. The next day she'll show up as a union boss in Chicago. The next day a union boss in Alabama. I mean, she she can be anything you want her to be. And, that's, and today, you know, she was she, she was presidential. Very nice. Anyway, I don't know if she hates Israel. But anyway, but what does he say? Trump his foreign policy, and probably his domestic policy, I followed it a lot less, but his foreign policy was guided by two things. One was common sense and reality, right? I mean, like, he'd look, he'd see, oh, I mean, and there are things that matter to him. Industry matters to him. So he would look, he'd see that the Rust Belt is dead, you know, and people are all, you know, you have all of these painkiller epidemics, and people are getting addicted to heroin because they're addicted to painkillers because they're depressed and everybody's unemployed and now, you know, and increasingly unemployable because they're hooked on drugs or whatever. So he's looking at this. He said, we have to bring back jobs. We have to bring back industry. Would that be the top priority of everybody who is looking at the situation? I don't know. That's his priority. These are the things that he sees. These are the things he cares about. And he adopts policies in order to advance the goals that he's laid out. I want to rebuild American industry. I want America to be great again as the industrial capital of the world, et cetera, and in energy independent and, and blah, you know, all of these things. That's how he sees things. But he looks, what is going on? I mean, how do we fix it? And he's not a good speaker. He's a rambler, as we just saw, off to Ukraine, back to Israel, et cetera. But that's one thing. Another thing is that he understands what I consider to be the golden rule of foreign policy, whether you're Israel or America or out of Mongolia or wherever, which I don't even know is the country. But anyway, whoever you are, 
the golden rule, as I say to foreign policy, is be good to your friends and bad to your enemies, because then people will either want to be your friends or they or will want to be your friends. They won't want to be your enemies. Or if you're dealing with people that you're not quite sure how to deal with, you want to make it clear to them that it's not in their interest to mess with you. Right. And so part of that is is giving them stuff, giving them love, giving them honor. If they're Xi, if they're Putin, if they're King Jong Un or whoever, you know, be nice to them. And, you know, have them over to Camp David or whatever. Is this a good a policy or not? I don't know. I mean, he didn't enact his Afghan withdrawal that would have left American forces in Bagram Air, Fort, Air Base and not, you know, surrendered 90 million or 90 billion or 85 billion or whatever in arms to the Taliban. I mean, that wasn't his goal. He wanted to pull out of Afghanistan, but recently he said that he intended to maintain America's presence in, Bag- in Bagram Air Base, whatever. Maybe that was his plan. Maybe he had a different plan. Whatever. He wasn't reelected, and and he didn't and he didn't carry it out. And said what we got was Biden's fiasco in uh, August 2021, that saw 13 Americans killed in a suicide bomb outside of the Afghan uh, capital's airport, and all of those horrible footages of the Afghans trying to hold on to the wheels of American Hercules jets to get out and all the rest of that calamity, that calamitous withdrawal that uh, Kamala and Joe brought us. At any rate, he, he, had, he has this idea that foreign policy is supposed to be guided by what you can actually do. Like, what can you accomplish without paying a price that you think is too high? And you make peace by being good to your friends and bad to your enemies. And you see in his rambling discourse here that that's what he's talking about, whether it's related to you know, ending the war between Ukraine and and Russia because he's not willing to bring American forces or whatever or widen the war to other arenas in order to bring about the collapse of Russia. He's not willing to do that. So he wants to end the war as quickly as possible in terms as good as he can achieve. And in Israel, what he said is, Kamala hates Israel. Israel won't exist in two years if she's president. I, you know, we believe that we are the eternal people for a reason. God wants us here. And so, no, we're not going anywhere. And aside from that, we, I, I don't think Israel's going to be defeated. I think that we're going to have a horrible time if she's president, because look what she just said her policy is, right? Her policy is openly hostile to Israel. I think that's true. And I don't think his is. And what did he say about Iran? He said, they didn't have any money when I was there because I instituted these economic uh, sanctions against Iran that crippled their economy, that made it impossible for them to fund Hamas and the Houthis and and all the rest of them. And now they're swimming in dough, three hundred billion dollars that they've made during the uh, the the Biden Harris administration because they stopped enforcing sanctions. I'd reinstate sanctions, and so that's you know that's what he said. And so in his rambling way, he made very clear that he maintains the course with the. Uh, basic uh, principles of his foreign policy, reality dictates policy, and the way that you win is by being good to your friends and bad to your enemies, but not too bad to your enemies in the sense that you don't push them past the brink of what you're willing to deal with. Okay, so th- that's that's basically how he ran American foreign policy, and lo and behold, America was respected again, and he brought peace to the Middle East, and he did deter Iran very much. Very much. You know, we didn't have the same kind of situation. Now, were they planning for the day after Trump? Absolutely. Most of the planning, you know, began both on Hezbollah's invasion plan and on what happened in Gaza uh, during his presidency. So they always use all the time between wars to prepare for the next round. They do that. Israel should be doing that. America should be doing that. Everybody responsible for their security should be doing that, whether you're the defender or the aggressor. In this case, you know, he he rebuilt the American military. So he did that, too. You know, he massively expanded uh, U.S. uh, military budgets in order to rebuild what he felt had been harmed under his predecessor's presidency. So, you know, and then we get to Davis, right? We get to Davis. What does she say? That little, you know, that that propagandist. What does she say? Oh, Kamala, do you hate Israel? I mean, that's. Like everything that he said about foreign policy, she just ignored it all. The principles of foreign policy, she ignored. What happened with Iran, with the Houthis, she ignored. The question of whether or not, she didn't even ask Trump, why do you keep saying that Hamas wouldn't have invaded on October 7th? Maybe you can explain that. That would have been, like for me, that would have been a follow-on. Nobody has actually asked him that, and I'm sure that he'd give a really good explanation, which is, of course, why she didn't ask it, right? So instead, she just said to 
Kamala, because this is all about our feelings. This is all about our emotions. Do you love? Do you hate? Da, 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 da. It's not about the survival of human freedom on planet Earth. It's not about the onslaught against innocence by sadists who, who, who march under the flag of jihad. None, none, none of that is important on September 10th, 2024. It's all Israel killing, right? People being held hostage, but no names, right? And how does Kamala feel about Israel? Does she love it or does she hate it? And whoa, <laughs> she loves Israel. Look, watch what she says. Vice President Harris, he says you hate Israel. Uh, that's absolutely not true. I have my entire career and life supported Israel and the Israeli people. He knows that. He's trying to, again, divide and, and distract from the reality, which is it is very well known that Donald Trump is weak and wrong on national security and foreign policy. It is well known that he admires dictators, wants to be a dictator on day one, according to himself. It is well known that he said of Putin that he can do whatever the hell he wants and go into Ukraine. It is well known that he said when Russia went into Ukraine, it was brilliant. It is well known he exchanged love letters with Kim Jong-un. And it is absolutely well known that these dictators and autocrats are rooting for you to be president again because they're so clear they can manipulate you with flattery and favors. And that is why so many military leaders who you have worked with have told me you are a disgrace. That is why we understand that we have to have a president who is not consistently weak and wrong on Vice national president security, Harris. including the importance of upholding and respecting in highest regard our military. All right, so we don't have to watch all of her blah, blah about how he loves dictators. We've seen this whole, you know, whatever before, you know. Yeah, he hates, he loves dictators. He's Putin, you know, he's Putin's suit. It's true, as he mentioned, you know, Putin endorsed Kamala Harris, but she just goes like that, and everybody says, oh, yeah, you know what you're talking about. Boy, she, he got, she got the better of him in that exchange. But what we saw here, okay, what we saw here, and yeah, I guess I'm a little bit riled up about it, whatever, she just presented in, in, this, in this little, you know, in this little exchange, this one exchange about the war, right, between Israel and whatever, because we don't mention Hamas, we don't mention the Palestinians, except as victims, right, because Israel kills them all. And they have to get dignity and security and all of that. No terrorism, no, you know, totally, not only is there moral equivalence between Israel and the Palestinians, Palestinians are like pure as the driven snow. They're all victims, and Israel is the aggressor, and she's evil, and our soldiers being killed doesn't matter, and the sacrifice that their families are making and the number of soldiers that we've lost fighting this conflict for our national survival, there's no empathy in that. There's no empathy in the victims. It's all empathy for the Palestinians who cheered and carried out the immolation the, the burning, the rape, the murder, the kidnapping, the torture of our people, and then cheered as the triumphant terrorists came back to Gaza with, with, our, with, with their Jewish victims, right? I mean, whether alive or dead. But they're all victims. They're as pure as the driven snow, and Israel is a bunch of criminals, a bunch of war criminals. Netanyahu is, you know, holding all the hostages in his cellar, and T Kamala Harris came out, and she presented literally the most hostile approach to Israel and the Palestinians ever uttered by a senior American official. And she is leading and probably will lead even more after this debate. But who knows? I don't know. Uh, uh, she is leading contender for the presidency for the next president for in in November 5th election. OK, that's her. She came off as presidential. Everybody can go home. We're all fine. And by the way, it's true that I listened most closely to this exchange. When I heard the rest of it, I started playing it a double time at a certain point because I just didn't feel like uh, having to watch it for 90 minutes. 45 was enough as far as I was concerned. But, um, you know, all of them were kind of along the same lines, right, that she would make statements. He was fact-checked, I think, four or five times. She was never fact-checked. She would say things that were told, you know, that, that were either wrong or, you know, easily torn apart, and there was no challenge, right? And in the meantime, you know, Donald Trump, you're a terrible person. Why are you a terrible person? 
You know, and, and that's just how it goes. And anything that he said, all of his rambling, which may have been rambling, but it was all very sensible, you know, that that was all bad, right? Because he's Donald Trump and she's presidential now. She's been re reincarnated as presidential Kamala. And that's who she's going to be until November 5th because they're not going to let her get off script ever again. At any rate, she presented this very cogent, very hostile position on Israel. No Islam. That no nothing. No, you know, no it, America suffered the same fate on 9-11, but, you know, in different way, it wasn't the same sadism in the sense that, you know, yeah, the victims suffered greatly as they died, as they were incinerated in the towers, in the Pentagon, on the airplanes, right? But it wasn't the same venom. It wasn't the same sort of monstrous face that we could place on the on, on the uh, hijackers, on the mass murderers, because all we saw were the mugshots, not during the attack itself. It was just something that happened. And the same America that, you know, you had a President Bush who was there, and he used the term Islamic terrorism once, or was it an Islamic terrorism? I think it was something along those lines. He never said it again. And he made it all about democracy, and he just sort of pivoted away from the reality of what was happening. And look, when you don't handle a threat, when you don't handle a poison, when you don't handle an enemy, when you don't look at it in its eye and say what it is and say what has to be done to destroy it, you're going to enable it. You're going to empower it. You're going to continue. You're going to enable it to continue, which is precisely, right, what Kamala Harris will do vis-a-vis -vis Iran that Israel's allowed to defend itself against by catching the missiles, but not take the missiles out in Iran, right? Not destabilize the Iranian regime, which she and Joe Biden have been, you know, have been supporting with all of the sanctions that they haven't been enforcing, allowing them to renew all of their oil exports and their gas exports and their terrorism exports, right? So that'll continue on apace. Tehran, the epicenter of global terrorism, as Donald Trump rightly pointed out, and the Palestinians are going to get a state by hook or by crook and over Israel's dead bodies. Literally, right? This is what's going to happen if she gets elected. But you wouldn't know that from this discourse. You wouldn't understand that what she just said effectively, if you, if you, if you use Israel and Hamas or Israel and the Palestinians as a parallel to America and al-Qaeda and to Islamic terrorism and to jihad, right, that seeks the destruction of both Israel and America. What she essentially said is what the, what the New York Times said on September 12th, which essentially is, what did we do to make them hate us? Not why are they evil, but how, how are we responsible for what just happened? And what she said is that Israel is responsible for what happened to it. It's responsible for ending the war in defeat because it's the bad guy. It's the one killing women and children. And Hamas is to be rewarded with victory and a state. That's what she said. 23 years after 9-11, she supports the jihadists against America and its allies. That is the position that she set out with the active and enthusiastic support and at the prodding and urging of Lindsey Davis. And here was Trump. He was given a question that was completely ungrounded to any reality. And you know what? He answered it. You don't support terrorism. You don't fund terrorism. You stand with your allies. You don't stand with people who want to annihilate your allies. Israel won't be destroyed. He was wrong about that. But Israel will suffer. And he was right about that. And it didn't suffer when he was president because he knew who did. He said who did 9-11 over and over and over again. And he said that his policy is to prevent them from winning whether in Iraq or in Afghanistan or in the United States or here, right here in the state of Israel. That's what happened last night on the eve of September 11, 2024. And, you know, this can go on for only so long until the other shoe drops, and it will drop, and then another shoe will drop, a bigger one, a heavier one, and another one, and another heavy one, because that's what happens when you ignore reality when you enable, empower, facilitate the crimes of your enemies at the expense of your friends. That's what will happen. That's what we saw last night. And what else we saw that was most terrifying was that nobody is able to even reflect 
on what just happened. Nobody watching this and, you know, every all of us journalists, I guess you want to call it, people who are are in this bracket, you know, of news, of foreign policy, of it, of national security, you know, if we're if we're worth anything, we put ourselves when we're looking at a spectacle like the debate last night in in the chair, in the seat of somebody who's just watching, you know, just a, an average Joe. Would he know just how many degrees divorced from reality that exchange was, how pernicious, how insidious it really was? Why? Why would he? When has he ever heard anything except what his lying eyes showed him on October 7th? And every day since. But you have to be able to find the images. You have to know where to look. You're not going to find it clearly on ABC News. Not on 9-11, not on 9-10, and not on any other day of the year, unfortunately. And we're all the poorer for it. Those are my thoughts today on 9-11-2024. God willing, 9-11-2025 will be safer, not in a more dangerous situation. That's our prayer. That's our hope. And that's what we're all fighting for. And I'll see you again next week. Take care.